Hi everyone. After seven rounds at the Edmonton International Chess Tournament, Indian Grandmaster Surya Ganguly had a perfect score of seven straight wins. But uh, he hadn't yet faced the uh, players that were just behind him in second and third place. Just behind in second place was uh, Sam Shanklin, who had a score of six and a half out of seven. His only draw was uh, in the second round against Alexei Shirov. They drew, and then he won all his other games. And then Shirov was in third place behind uh, Sam Shanklin. And uh, for the next two rounds then, Surya Ganguly had to face uh, Shanklin and Shirov, had to play both of the uh, top two players in rounds eight and nine. So, uh, and both those games turned out to be very interesting, and of course they were decisive for the result of the tournament. So I thought I would take a look at those two games to uh, finish off my coverage. And uh, starting with this game, um, in this game, Surya Ganguly has the white pieces, and he's facing Alexei Shirov with the black pieces. So Shirov, being in third place in the tournament, really needs a win to try and uh, uh, improve his score. I don't know if he had, at this point, any chance of winning, but he still wants to uh, do as well as possible. Uh, Surya Ganguly starts off with e4. Shirov played c5. And uh, the Sicilian defense, a nice fighting choice. Knight f3, knight c6. And what uh, Sherov is going for here is the Sveshnikov, and uh, Ganguly obliges by playing the open Sicilian. d4, c takes, knight takes, and knight f6. If, um, if black plays the move e5 immediately, that's known as the Kalashnikov, which has some similarities to the Sveshnikov, but it allows, at a certain point, it allows white to get in the move uh, c4, setting up a Meroxy bind. So knight f6 first as a way of... Uh, encouraging this knight to come out to c3, blocking the c-pawn, a common technique in, in the Sicilian. And now e5, kicking this knight. And the knight goes over here to b5, taking a look at the d6 square. So pawn to d6 is played to keep the knight from hopping in there. And now bishop to g5. So this is a critical moment, and bishop to g5 is really um, um, a pretty necessary move. You've got to do something about an impending threat that black has of pushing this pawn forward and then this pawn forward. And uh, this knight will have to drop back, and then there's a threat of forking these two knights and driving this knight away from defense of the e-pawn. So this uh, bishop g5 move is kind of a dual-purpose move. It pins the knight so that the uh, this pawn is no longer um, under threat, and if necessary, the bishop can just take off the knight. And it also prepares uh, the move knight to... Uh, b5. So it's really critical to get that move bishop g5 in if you're ever playing the white side of the Sveshnikov here. Uh, a6 kicking the knight back to a3. b5. And now this knight really needs to get out of town. There's a, a danger of the fork here. Of course, either knight could move to solve the problem with the fork, but this knight has the best prospects at this point. So knight to d5. And now there's uh, an uncomfortable pressure on this knight on f6. So Bishop to uh, e7 is played, breaking the pin and threatening to take on a5. And so now the bishop gives itself up for the knight. And all this is a uh, very standard play. At this point, white uh, moves the c-pawn. It can go to c3 or to c4 directly, starting to undermine these queenside pawns. But Sheriff plays c3, which is, I guess, still the main move. Um, and then this move, bishop to g5, was played. Uh, I saw this once in a tournament game when I was playing. I faced this once, and uh, I was really surprised by the move bishop g5. If we back up for a second, you know, it's not clear that uh, this bishop is so much worse than this knight that uh, that black that white is even going to bother exchanging it off. Um, so why why is black moving the knight the bishop again? And is it really just to save the bishop pair? But that uh, seems to be the case. I guess uh, you could also argue this is a good. Uh, diagonal for the bishop. Keeps the knight from coming to the c-file for one thing, and it keeps the rook from coming to the c-file. Anyway, um, the the uh, the line that I've always seen, or more typically seen, and what I was expecting when I played this uh, is uh, knight to e7. This knight drops back to harass this knight, and now white usually does grab the bishop. Knight takes bishop, pawn takes, because not only are you uh, winning a bishop, but you're also uh, messing up the pawns on the king side. And this is a very interesting position to play for both sides, white or black. Black has ideas of pushing the f-pawn forward, 
both of them actually, one after the other, and uh, disrupting the center. And, um, you know, Black's King, I guess, is going to be staying in the center for a while, or at least not, not castling until it's uh, clear that that's going to be safe. <laughs> uh, anyway, interesting play for both sides there. Um, but uh, Sheriff goes with the Bishop G5 line, which is actually the main move in the database I was looking at. Now, Knight to C2, this Knight on the edge of the board needs to route itself back into the game somehow. And Rook to B8. This is an interesting move from Sheriff. This is not the uh, top choice in this position, but it's one of the three main moves here. Uh, the other choices are uh, castles. Uh, black can just castle here, and white will continue with A4 and just start to undermine these queenside pawns. Just like in the uh, Rui Lopez, whenever black has pushed these queenside pawns, it's often an idea for white to counterattack and try and undermine them, create some weaknesses there. Um, the other way of playing this after knight c2 is to play uh, knight to uh, e7, just retreating this knight and uh, and uh, putting some pressure on the, the knight on b5. And then usually white will throw an h4 to kick this bishop around, and then maybe knight b4, something to support this knight here. So uh, all this has been played before, and uh, those are all interesting ways to play. But rook to b8 is a fine move. It's uh, it's controlling the b6 square, stopping the knight from hopping in there, and um, maybe getting away from potential forks on c7. And it also is uh, prepared for the opening of the b-file after uh, white plays a4, going with this idea of opening up the, uh, uh, weakening the queen side here. Then uh, black can play b takes a4 and open up uh, the b-file for this rook. So uh, very interesting play from black. Now this knight goes to b4 and uh, Black trades it off. Knight takes b4, and um, c takes b4 is what uh, Surya played here. Um, I was really expecting knight takes b4, and that is, in fact, the most popular move here. Um, c takes b4 is a bit of an unusual choice. If you take with the knight, notice that it comes with a threat of uh, knight to c6, forking those two uh, pieces. So there's no time, for example, to throw an a5 and try and pick up the b-pawn here, uh, bishop to d7 is played and uh, well the game would continue from here but this is the typical way it might proceed so uh, surya chooses to go with a bit of an obscure sideline by taking with the uh, taking with the c pawn c takes b4 uh, but this is still in the opening book so this is all probably in both players uh, preparation uh, black castles here and now rook takes a4 so rook so white gets back the pawn and the material is even once again um, and Sheriff here plays a5, and uh, white can respond to that immediately with b5, uh, but um, uh, Surya Ganguly throws in the move h4, kicking the bishop back. And notice actually that um, bishop takes is a bit of a mistake here. If the bishop takes the pawn, well, more than a bit of a mistake, it actually loses quite a bit of material after queen h5. It's a combination of a mating threat on uh, h7 and a threat on the bishop. It's going to uh, win some material. So this uh, h4 move forces the bishop back. Um, the bishop wants to stay on this diagonal. It doesn't want to go back and get get traded for the knight on one of those two squares. If it wanted to be traded for the knight, it could have done that uh, much earlier. So it drops back to h6. And now b5 is played, saving the uh, b pawn and, and getting a passed pawn here. So, pretty interesting play, but still, all this has been played before. Bishop d7, pinning that pawn, and uh, now it's under pressure. It's defended once and attacked twice, so knight drops back to defend. And uh, d5, this is a pawn sack, but uh, this pawn sack has also been played before, so this is not, not uh, original at this point. But it's an interesting uh, sacrifice. Black is giving up a center pawn. But it, that pawn is always a weakness. This, this pawn is something that is going to be a target for most of the game. So uh, why not just give it up? And in exchange, black will get uh, some play against these uh, somewhat scattered pawns that white has. And also open lines for the bishop. White for the bishops. Black has the bishop pair and white doesn't. So, so the open lines should favor black in this position. So it seems worthwhile to, it seems like a valid sacrifice to give up that pawn. And now Sheriff plays with e4, and that's really the first new move, uh, at least the first move that was not in my database. So what's been played here before is uh, just king to h8. 
which actually Sherov plays in a moment or two. So I don't know if there's a lot of independent significance to uh, this move e4. But um, well, it's pretty logical what white, black is going for here. Notice that white has never developed a kingside bishop. It is doing a useful job here in a way. It's holding on to that pawn. But um, so I can't say it's a totally useless bishop, but it hasn't been developed, which means that uh, white can't castle. Also, there's pressure on this pawn, so uh, white can't castle for that reason. It would just drop the uh, it would just drop the h pawn if white were to castle. Um, so it'll take a couple steps for white to castle here, and uh, and in the meantime, black is going to start pushing these pawns forward and trying to create some open lines, hoping to catch white's king in the center of the board and embarrass it. So um, bishop to e2 is played now. White starts to make uh, preparations to get the king out of the center, and f5 is played. D6 as pawn comes forward, opening up uh, this diagonal towards white's king, and now king h8 is played. So that's uh, like I said before, uh, well, king h8 could have been played instead of that uh, e4 move, but uh, it it, can, it also gets played here. Um, let's see, and now g3 is played. So once again, uh, preparing to castle. Now that this h pawn is defended, it's actually uh, safe for white to castle over here. Maybe it's safe. <laughs> Can't say for sure because there's still ideas of opening up lines here with these pawn pushes. And in fact, uh, Sheriff at this point sacrifices a second pawn with f4. So I'm uh, thinking that this is over the board uh, inspiration rather than uh, home preparation, although it's possible this is a prepared sacrifice. But anyway, white goes uh, two pawns down, black. Black goes two pawns down for the moment, gives up the e pawn in exchange for uh, inflicting some damage over here on the uh, king side and also gaining some tempos. It starts with this move, bishop to f4, f5, kicking the rook. Rook goes to e5, and now queen to f6, setting up this uh, ominous battery along the f-file. So um, Surya lifts his queen, centralizes the queen, and gets it out to a more active square. And now Shirov opens up the f-file with f takes g3, f takes g3, and now uh, plays the move that seems to be a mistake. So um, looking at this with a chess engine, it's a, it's a very complicated position. You can see there's ideas here because the, uh, the king has still not been castled and it's, uh, if this bishop were just not in the way, um, then it would not be possible for, uh, for white to castle. And uh, these open lines with the bishops, with black's bishops might, uh, might prove uh, disastrous for uh, for white here, but it's uh, white also has threats as well. White has two passed pawns, which are both getting pretty close to uh, to the uh, touchdown line there. So um, anyway, very double-edged position. It seems the best move here, looking at it with a chess engine, is g6. Not the first move I would have thought of in this position, but uh, well, let's check out this line. It allows white to castle, but uh, allows this uh, bishop to reroute to g7. And uh, now there's a threat to just take off that rook. The rook comes in here to e7. And then this other rook, the rook on the b file, can come over here to d8 and uh, start to put pressure on this advanced pawn. I think that's the idea is this uh, g6 move is preparing this maneuver and, and uh, trying to round up this uh, killer pawn from white before it becomes uh, deadly. Um, g4 is played here, taking advantage of the pin. That bishop has been sitting there subject to a pin for a while now, but, well, this is the first time that black didn't have an immediate threat against white, so white had time to play that move. And uh, rook takes d6, giving up this pawn. Um, the queen moves. The queen goes over here to b7, and then um, rook to uh, g8, defending the bishop. So this is interesting. This just gives up the other bishop. But... Uh, after g takes f5, we have uh, rook to f4. And now there's um, bishop to f8, starting to push these pieces back. So we can pause here. And uh, oh, this comes with a check. That's right. Bishop to f8 check wins material. So um, this is uh, still a position which is, is crazy complicated. <laughs> and uh, it's rated as slightly better for white, but not uh, winning. But uh, yeah, this bishop f1 check is a key idea to uh, get get material back. Um, you might wonder why doesn't uh, 
white plays something else at this point, maybe move the king away from the uh, from the G file to avoid that discovered check. But if the king goes over to the H file, then the queen is coming in here, and this is also uh, this is actually winning for black all of a sudden. So uh, anyway, a very tricky position, and uh, hard to find that move G6. Um, so queen G6 was played, and um, this would be a good move, except for there's just one reply that white has. So if you want to uh, see if you can find the best reply for white, there's one reply that white has here that is winning for white, and everything else, uh, black is at least equal and maybe better. So yeah, pause the video if you want some time to look at this and see if you can find the best move for white here. Okay, uh, maybe you guys found this. I don't know if it's too hard to find. Anyway, the best move here is uh, g4. Moving this pawn forward, protected by the bishop, and um, if the bishop takes that pawn, I guess this is the real point, and bishop takes g4, then rook g1, and that bishop is pinned, and that's, uh, that's a difficult pin to get out of, uh, that uh, black is going to end up losing material that way. So after g4, the bishop has to drop back, and it goes back to c8. And now the tables have turned, and uh, white has a uh, winning position. Well, I can't say the tables have turned. The, the game was uh, in the range of even to slightly better for white all along, but, but uh, black definitely had a fighting chance up until this point. And now with uh, accurate play, uh, white is just winning. And, uh, well, we see an example of this kind of accurate play from uh, Surya Ganguly. Uh, so after bishop c8, he plays knight e4, just uh, bringing his knight over. Um, bishop goes to b7, hitting hitting the queen and hoping to trade off some uh, pieces here. Um, black has ideas of getting at least one of the pawns back and going into an endgame, a pawn down. Um, but notice that Surya doesn't, doesn't lose his cool here and move the queen right away. He first throws in uh, h5, kicking um, black's queen and forcing it into some difficult decisions. And, um, and, and the best choice here turns out to be, also verified by the chess engine, uh, a complicated series of exchanges starting with uh, queen takes e4. So remember, um, white's queen is hanging as well, so just taking back the queen and losing the queen is, is a bad idea. So it's queen takes e4. I mean, taking with a rook was a bad idea because uh, I would lose the queen. So queen takes e4, bishop takes e4, rook takes e4, and we get this position where the material is even. Um, it looks like black is going to get one of these pawns back. Well, it happens in a few moves, so I'll just, just go forward to that point. Let's see, the f rook comes over here to d8, and uh, white's rook is still over here in the corner, uh, still a little bit out of play. This rook goes to d4 to um, defend the pawn. The bishop goes to c1 to attack uh, another pawn here. Um, d7 is played, and bishop takes b2. So, so black got a pawn back. White is just one pawn up in this endgame. There's bishops of opposite color, but uh, there's still rooks on the board. And as long as there's still rooks on the board along with the bishop, um, this is still a very double-edged position and uh, possibilities for both sides. It's possible also for black to get something going on the black squares if white is not on the dark squares if uh, white is not careful. But in general, white should be um, better here. White is better here, according to the chess engine. So anyway, the rook is under fire. Rook to d5 is played. Now rook to b7, ganging up on the uh, d-pawn. And finally, on move 36 here, white castles. <laughs> so that gets the king to a slightly safer position, just like castling in the middle game or in the opening. And it also gets the rook onto an active uh, file and prepares to bring it over here to defend. And notice that it also defends the uh, d-pawn because if black takes the d-pawn, white will take back and there's a back rank mate. So the uh, d-pawn is defended. Um, g6 was played to uh, solve that problem of the back rank mate, but uh, h6 by white reintroduces the same problem. Black's king is still trapped on the back rank. So um, bishop to a3 was played. Now rook to f7. The rook comes all the way forward to the 7th rank, adding another defender to the pawn. Um, not just defending it indirectly, but now it's directly defended, and also uh, with pressure along the 7th rank. Um, a4 is played. 
Black has got a passed pawn as well, so he's going to try and get some play with it. Uh, rook to e5, hitting that, or cancel that. Rook to e5. Okay, threatening to come over here and uh, win a queen, or turn that pawn into a queen that way. So rook b to b8, that, that, pawn, that rook is forced back. It needs to cover this uh, rook e8 idea. And then uh, bishop to c4 was played. Oh, it's White's turn. Bishop to c4. And uh, Black plays bishop to f8. This uh, brings the, the bishop back for defense. Maybe it's taking a look at this pawn over here and also getting out of the way of the a pawn can potentially become a runner. King to g2 is played, getting the king away from any uh, potential checks from that bishop and maybe preparing to enter the game at, at the right moment. a3. But this pawn, even though it got all the way up to a3, is not going any further with the light squared bishop covering covering the uh, next square. Um, let's see. Bishop to a2 was played, just, just sitting there and waiting for... Uh, for white or black to try and find a move. In fact, this rest of the game here is a, a pretty good example of a, how white is just kind of smothering black and running him out of moves. Um, let's see, black tried uh, bishop to d6 here, hitting the rook, the rook went to e6, cancel that, e6, and the bishop went back to f8, and now um, white played b6, Siri Ganguly played b6, and uh, black resigned. So maybe it's a little bit mysterious why uh, Black resigned here, but basically he's out of moves. And uh, I, I looked at a couple of different continuations from this point. Uh, notice it's very difficult for the uh, for these rooks to find any squares to go to, but the bishop can move back and forth. So how about you try something like uh, bishop to b4, just moving the bishop around. Uh, White's going to continue pushing the pawn forward, pawn to a7 or b7. Now all these squares on the back rank are covered. And, um, and so this, this rook has uh, almost no moves. And um, let's see, bishop back to f8, just kind of marking time. Then bishop to c4. Um, black plays another move, or white. White plays another move, mainly just to uh, run black out of moves. And now if black moves the bishop again, one last uh, move of the bishop, and things just fall apart at this point. Bishop c5, finally this rook can come in here and check on e8. Rook takes, uh, pawn takes, becoming a queen. Rook takes, and rook to c7. That's the key winning idea here. And there's no defense. The king can't leave the back rank, and uh, the rook is just going to come down to c8 and force a queen through. And it doesn't matter if this rook stays here or if it goes over this way. Um, Basically, black needs two moves. He needs to get the rook to this square and get the bishop to a square that defends it. And they can't can't do both at once. It's probably a critical reason for lifting the white king off of those uh, dark squares to avoid giving any tempos to the bishop. Um, okay, so but let's let's uh, see if there's some other tries here. It's kind of an interesting position after bishop to c4. Um, instead of moving the bishop and allowing that rook to e8. Um, what else could be tried here? Well, first of all, the two pawn moves. Uh, if you play a2, um, you know, white's just going to take it, and that hasn't improved the situation at all. If you play um, g5 here, trying to just uh, stall for time, then uh, rook to e5 not only rounds up that pawn, but gets this rook over to a, uh, an important uh, file over here. So that doesn't help as well. There's one more try that uh, black has here in this position besides uh, moving pawns and moving the bishop, um, and that's to try moving the king. So king to g8 could be tried here, and then there's a very nice idea here. Rook to e8 is played anyway. At first this looks like um, white is just giving up material, uh, but there's a clever checkmating idea here. So if you want to uh, uh, see if you can spot it after uh, rook takes rook, it's white's turn to move. Can you find the mate here? Okay, the answer is uh, rook to g7. This is a double check, and so that was the point of that uh, rook to e8 move. It's to clear this diagonal uh, with a tempo. <laughs> so rook to e8, rook takes rook. It looks like you know you're going to queen, and then uh, black's going to pick up the queen, and and uh, he'll survive this for a bit. But uh, rook to g8, uh, rook to g7 is a double check. 
the king has to move and the only square the only legal square is the corner and then rook to g8 is mate so a very pretty finish so anyway let's uh, back up to the game in this position after um, after yeah after b6 was played um, Shirov resigned so uh, as a result of this game uh, Shirov ended up in uh, first place or uh, third place and uh, the fight the fight for uh, first place will be determined by the game between uh, Surya Ganguly and uh, Sam Shankland and I will show you that next time see you then bye